you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray you do, I'd invite you to open to 1 John chapter 1. If you're using a Black Pew Bible, it is on page 1021. Somebody's at somebody's house, I can hear your ring camera going off. Everybody's got one of those now, and every time it goes off, everybody looks at their phone. I know, because I do it too, but I have my phone on silent right now. Just say it. You might want to think about doing that. <laughs> a Yale physicist named Robert Adair uh, studied the science behind hitting a major league fastball, and he published his findings in a book from 2002 called The Physics of Baseball, and he found out some really fascinating things. He found out that a 90-mile-an-hour fastball travels 60 feet, 6 inches from the pitcher's hand to the catcher's glove in 400 milliseconds, which is less than half a second. Uh, now he said that it takes the batter's brain 200 milliseconds to find the ball in the air, to get the image in his mind and decide whether or not to swing. So roughly half the time the ball is in the air, the batter is simply trying to decide what to do. Uh, if he decides to swing, the brain spends another 100 milliseconds deciding whether to swing the bat high, low, inside or outside the strike zone. So you're down 300 milliseconds and you haven't even swung the bat yet. Uh, the swing itself takes 150 milliseconds. Now during the first 50 milliseconds, you can stop the swing, but after that the bat is traveling 70% of full speed and you can't stop it. Adair says that a seven millisecond variation will cause the batter to either hit a foul ball or to miss the pitch altogether. Now if we do the math, you spend 200 milliseconds locating the ball. You spend 100 milliseconds making a decision whether or not to hit it, and you spend 150 milliseconds actually swinging the bat, which equals 450 milliseconds. That's a problem, because at 400 milliseconds, the ball is in the catcher's mitt. And so Adair concludes in his book that according to the laws of physics, hitting a 90-mile-an-hour fastball is, according to him, quote, clearly impossible. How many of you agree with that conclusion? Patrick put his hand up, and I had to call him out on that. <laughs> the rest of you don't. Why not? Because you say, well, I don't know the math. Uh, I don't know the physics, but I've seen it happen. <laughs> he tried, but he couldn't. So he can't, and neither can I, and nobody on the Baltimore Orioles can either, by the way. Uh, but, uh, uh -huh. I, I meant that on purpose. Uh, but you can't prove him wrong, but you've seen it. I've seen somebody hit a 90 mile an hour fastball. I've seen somebody hit a 95 mile an hour fastball. Uh, I can't explain the facts, but I can tell you this, I can't deny what I've seen. Because the undeniable takes precedence over the unexplainable. Hmm. We're starting a new series today called Prove It, where we're gonna go through the entire book of 1 John and, and study it from the, the eyewitness account of a man who who witnessed the, the, the life, the ministry, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and in, this, in this book, John says to us, basically, this is not a theory that we have accepted because we can't explain it all. Amen. He couldn't explain it all. Because Jesus rose from the dead, he believes this. Because he saw Jesus. Because he spoke to Jesus. Because he touched him. He felt the wounds in his body after his resurrection. John believed this. Now John wrote five books of the New Testament, roughly 20% of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote three epistles. Now, an epistle is not an apostle's wife. It's a letter. <laughs> they're, they're letters. Uh, first John is, is five chapters. The other two are, are very, very short, probably one page in your Bible. They probably stick together in your Bible, and you probably don't even know where they're at because they're so small, but they're, they're towards the back of the Bible. And then John wrote the book of Revelation. We spent 39 weeks in that book. So you all have heard quite a bit from Brother John. Uh, John wrote the gospel to convince sinners. He wrote the epistles to confirm the saints, and he wrote Revelation to comfort sufferers. He wrote the gospel for our salvation, the epistles for our sanctification, and he wrote the book of Revelation for our glorification. Now John always had a definite purpose in mind when he wrote. We don't have to try to guess why he wrote 1 John. He tells us four reasons. First was joy. Jesus was John's greatest joy. And he wants Jesus to be your greatest joy as well. 
The second reason John wrote it was for holiness. John is writing to keep us from sinning as much as we possibly can. Now, friends, John will tell us that Christians are not sinless, but Christians are able to sin less. We can sin less because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Third, he's writing this as a warning. John was fighting a heresy in his day, and it's a heresy that we still fight today because there are always going to be people who attack Jesus. They're either going to attack the deity of Christ or they're going to attack the humanity of Christ. There are always going to be people who try to deceive God's people and about Jesus and about Christian doctrine. So John's telling them to be on their guard. The fourth reason is probably my favorite. It's assurance of salvation. Can a person know that they're saved? John says yes. You can know that you know that you're saved. And, and this beautiful book, when somebody comes to Christ, if, 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 I'm, if I'm blessed enough to be there, share the gospel with them, see them be, be born again in the Lord, they'll say, well, well, I've never read the Bible, what should I read? I always say, go to 1 John. Read 1 John. It's an easy read, but it's going to assure you of your salvation. It's going to tell you who Jesus is, who you are, why you need him, how you get him, and what happens after you've got him. Amen. And that once you are firmly in his hand, nothing can pluck you out of that hand. You can have assurance of salvation. Now, in just four verses, which make up only two sentences, the Apostle John packs a lifetime of practical principles for all of us to understand that none of us should ever forget. So we're going to be starting in 1 John today, chapter 1. We're going to read the first four verses. It's on page 1021 of your Black Pew Bible. It's up on the screen. And if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard and proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for who you are. We thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself to us through your word, through creation, and more importantly, through your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And as we open up your blessed word today, God, I pray you would speak to us. Reveal to us who we are. Reveal to us who you are. Show us, Holy Spirit, who Jesus is and why we so desperately need him. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So I pray today, God, that you would comfort those who are hurting. I pray that you would challenge those who are comfortable today. I pray you would convict those who are far from you and lead them into salvation. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do during this time. That's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So John is saying the undeniable takes precedence over the unexplainable. And the first thing he does, the very first thing that John wants to do is tell us who Jesus is. He doesn't do a preamble like Paul. He doesn't, he doesn't say, uh, John, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to all the saints here and there. He gets right down to business. I mean, he, he, he is on it. And, and he's telling us right off the bat that if we get who Jesus is wrong, it doesn't matter what else we get right. We've got to know who Christ is, and we've got to get who Jesus is, the reality of the person of Jesus, correct. He says that which was from the beginning, what he's telling us is that Jesus Christ is real. Jesus is real. Somebody say amen to that. I don't think you can't hear me. Amen. Second Corinthians 4.18. Paul says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul is telling us that it's not what we can see necessarily that is real. Often it's what we can't see that is real. And John wants us to know that even though we can't, we can't see Jesus, 
He did, and he testifies to that. He tells us three ways in which Jesus is real. First, he's real in eternity. That which was from the beginning. It, it sounds just like his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There has never been a time that Jesus was not. Jesus is eternal. This is the first thing that John is trying to explain to us. This is the one thing he wants us to understand, that Jesus is God. He is preexistent. He was there in creation. He was present in creation. He is post-existent today, and he is forever existent in the future. There is never a time that Jesus was not, and there will never be a time that Jesus won't be. Amen. Amen. He is forever and always. He's co-equal with God. He's co-eternal with the Father, and he's co-existent with the Father. Jesus has always been. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I wish that I, I could say that I was the same person I was 20 years ago. Actually, you know what? I'm probably glad I'm not because I've grown deeper in Christ. I've grown deeper in Jesus than I did 20 years ago. So I have changed. And for those of you who knew me 20 years ago, you say, yeah, I know. <laughs> You're about 20 pounds heavier and a lot grayer. Because we change, but Jesus doesn't change. Jesus is steady. He, he's, he's always the same. He is great in eternity past. He is gracious in eternity present. And he is glorious in eternity future. He is real in eternity. John tells us he's also real in experience which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John is saying, listen, Jesus is not some fairy tale. He's not a myth. He's not a legend. He was a real man. Flesh and blood. Muscle and sinew. Bones and skin. Just like me and just like you. John says several times, over and over again, I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. John's saying, I am an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not simply talking about Jesus' ministry. He's saying, Jesus rose from the dead. I saw the resurrected Jesus. And he's real. He wants us to understand that Jesus is real. Because back in, in, that, in, in the first century, John was dealing with a, with a heretical group known as the Gnostics. Uh, the, the Greek word gnosis means knowledge. It means to know. Uh, you, you've heard, you probably you have, maybe have an agnostic friend. You hear the word agnostic. Anytime you add an A to a Greek word, it negates the word. So agnostic means to not know. So when people say that they're agnostic about God, they say, well, I, I don't know if there's a God. Well, they should know because the, the Bible has, has made it plain, nature has made it plain that there is a God. Their own soul has made it plain that there is a God. But an agnostic is someone who doesn't know. Uh, the Gnostics back in those days, they believed that they had special revelation uh, that gave them a, a, a key into who Jesus was and, and, and into a special uh, spiritual knowledge. What they believed was that all material was evil. That, that Flesh, blood, uh, anything that existed, anything physical, was evil. And in other words, they denied the humanity of Jesus. They said that Jesus could not have been flesh and blood because flesh and blood is evil. God can't be evil, and therefore Jesus was God. They affirmed that, but they never affirmed that Jesus was a human being. They said he just appeared to be human, but in reality he wasn't. And Jesus has always been attacked in one of two ways, either his humanity or his deity. John wrote his gospel to prove the deity of the Lord Jesus. John wrote this epistle to prove the humanity of the Lord Jesus. And listen, Gnosticism has not gone away. 10 to 15 years ago, Dan Brown wrote a, a novel called The Da Vinci Code. It's modern-day Gnosticism. It's denying the incarnation and the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. It is alive and well today. It is just as much a heresy to deny the humanity of Jesus as it is to deny the divinity of Jesus because Jesus is fully God and fully man. He wasn't half God, half man. He is all God and all man. He is the God man. Now, Jesus shows us this throughout Scripture. In John 4, he meets the woman at the well. 
He's been walking. He's weary and he's tired. He asks for a drink. He's thirsty. That's his humanity. Moments later, he reveals to her her entire sordid life story right up to the, the very guy that she's with now. That's his deity. Uh, so he, he's exhibiting his humanity and his deity at the same time. In Matthew 8, he's in Peter's boat. What does Jesus do? He goes to sleep on the boat. That's his humanity. He was tired. But when the wind and the waves came up, guess what he did? He calmed the wind and the waves. And only God can do that. So we see his humanity being proven. We see his deity being proven. John chapter 11 Jesus, being the good minister, goes to a funeral up at a place called Bethany. But guess what Jesus did every time he approached a funeral? He busted it up. Macomb's funeral home would not have liked Jesus Christ if he was ministering during their time. He would have put them completely out of business. But when Jesus comes up and he sees the Jews and how much they're crying and how much they're hurting, it breaks his heart. It says he groaned. And was deeply troubled in his spirit. John eleven thirty five 35 even says that Jesus wept. That was his humanity. He was flesh and blood. He felt that. But then moments later he calls out, Lazarus, come forth. That's his deity. Because death had to let Lazarus go. Because God said so. And when God says so, everything in creation does what he says. Doesn't have a choice. That is his humanity, and that is his deity. And John is saying, I have experienced that. I've seen it. John says, I have heard the Lord Jesus. And that verb in Greek is perfect tense. It's something that took place in the past that has a continual result in the present. It's not something that happened and is over. It's something that happened and continues to happen. John is saying, I heard Jesus and I continue to hear Jesus. Do you know that's possible today? You can still hear Jesus. He may be speaking to you in a still small voice, but he's speaking to you. And you may not hear it audibly in your ears, but you can hear it in your heart if you're listening to him. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, 27 My sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, you can hear the voice of Christ today. Some of you, he may be calling to salvation. He may be crying out to you today. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to be saved. Maybe you need a church family, and you need to join our church. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you simply need to, to start telling other people uh, to, to, to repent and come to Jesus. But Jesus is still speaking. Are we listening? That's the question that all of us have to ask ourselves. John could hear him. But not only did he hear him, he says he beheld him. Now John used that, that word in the beginning of his gospel as well. We beheld his glory. That word, uh, theasome, it's where we get our word theater from. It doesn't mean, hey, I simply glanced and, you know, hey, I saw Rufus at church today. Well, I didn't, I didn't speak to him. I didn't have a, a conversation with him, but I saw him. Uh, if I could see better with these glasses on, I could say I saw a lot more of you. But theosome doesn't mean to simply glimpse at someone and see them. It means to investigate, to scrutinize. He touched Jesus. He beheld Jesus. Friends, this is a eyewitness testimony. This, this is amazing. He had been with the risen Lord Jesus. He handled him. After his resurrection, Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. John had seen Jesus. He had beheld him. He touched him. He heard him. His experience was real. Finally, we see that Jesus is real in expression. John says, concerning the word of life, in verse 2, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and which was made manifest to us. John uses that word twice, manifest. It means to reveal something previously unknown. See, God reveals Himself to us. We will never know God unless He reveals Himself to us. 
But friends, I'm telling you, he reveals himself to us all the time. Just like hearing Jesus, we've got to be looking for him. And if we're looking for him, we're going to see him. First, he reveals himself in the skies through general revelation. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. You look at a flower. You look at a child. You look at a peacock. You look at anything. You will see God's hand at work. We see it in the soul. In the conscience of a human being. Made in the image and likeness of God with intellect, emotion, and will. Romans 1.20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. God has revealed himself to people. People know that there is a God. Listen, people reject Jesus because they don't want to obey Jesus. But they can't say that God hasn't revealed himself to them because they can see it in the skies, they can, they can see it uh, all around them, in the, in the human soul, they can see it in the scriptures. That's specific revelation. God has revealed himself to us. Man would have never written this. You know why? Because it makes us look really bad. It makes us look really bad really bad and all the heroes of the Bible the people that we, we, we th man I wish I could be like Moses well read the early days of Moses you might be I wish I could be like Joseph I wish I could be like Noah I wish I could be like this one. listen God didn't make you to be those people God made you to be you God saved you so that you could go out and be the epicenter of a, of a viral breakout of the gospel to tell other people about who Jesus is. Don't hoard your salvation. Go out and give it away freely. It's a free gift that you got. You didn't work for it. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. Just go give it away. You're going to, well, if I give it away, will I still have it? God will give you an a, a endless supply of his grace for you to dispel to all those around you. Finally, we see God revealed in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, John refers to Jesus as the word of life. Why is Jesus called the word? Well, what are words? Words are ways that we communicate with other people what we think and what we feel. Jesus is God's ultimate and final communication to us about who he is and how he feels. Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through him also he created the world. John says, have you experienced this Jesus? Because you can. You see, John not only heard him, saw him, and felt him, he knew Jesus, and he wants you to know him too. Second, we see the result of possessing Jesus. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John not only wants us to know who Jesus is, he wants us to know Jesus as Savior. He wants us to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And there are two things that you receive when you become a child of God. Number one, you enter into the family of God. Amen. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. When I, when I miss a Sunday... I'm usually not just sitting around kicking my heels up saying, whew, i got a day off. I miss you all. I miss this place. I've been haunting the, these, these buildings and this property for 20 years uh, as, a, as a printer and as a, a, a part-time minister, uh, as an unordained man, as an ordained man, as, a, as a, a, a minister on staff, as a finally as a pastor. And maybe one day they'll throw my bones out here in the cemetery. I don't know. But I miss you all because there's something very special about the family of God. Do you know what it is? It's Jesus. That's the an Jesus is always the answer. If I ask a question, it's probably Jesus is the answer. Jesus is what binds us all together. Now, you may not like me, but you've got to love me. <laughs> Amen. The blood of Christ covers all things. Amen. And as a family of God, we are, we are put together. We are held together. We consist, and we are, are 
are held in balance by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the scarlet thread that binds each and every one of us to the fabric of our heart. See, fellowship is a beautiful word, that Greek word koinonia. But we use fellowship in a very flippant way. I know we don't mean to, but we do. Men's breakfast, food and fellowship. I, I gotta, I, I'll be honest with you, it, it's food. <laughs> Because sitting around and eating some biscuits and gravy is one of my favorite things to do. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's fellowship because you say a prayer prior to or after. See, koinonia is, is doing something uh, together in ministry. I, I, uh, when we started the, the pastor's Bible study last fall, that was one of the words we spent all, probably half of a, a, a class talking about koinonia. And how it's, it's partnership in the gospel. It, it's, it's working together, going in the same direction for the good of the gospel, uh, for, for, the, for the advancement of the gospel. See, at salvation, we are immediately born again. We're born into the family of God. And as part of this family, we enjoy fellowship with one another. There is no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. You know, when, when COVID uh, hit, it killed fellowship. And one of the things that I, I kept getting emails, Pastor, we just, we miss being together. And, and I would always say, I know. And I miss you all being here. You know, I love preaching, but preaching to an empty sanctuary and, and putting it on video. I, I'm glad that I was able to minister to people like that uh, through, through YouTube and, and through Facebook. I miss seeing you all. I miss shaking hands. I miss hugging. Amen. Amen. We need this fellowship because, as Joe said when he got up to pray, every time we turn on the TV, it's bad news. It's bad news. We have a world that wants to step on our throats and keep us down. We need fellowship. We need the sweet spirit of God. And this is the place that we find it. Friends, if you can't get excited about coming to church and about fellowshipping with one another, you need to check your relationship because every Sunday is supposed to be a family reunion where we all get together as children of God and celebrate who he is celebrate with one another I think there's something desperately wrong with somebody who doesn't want to be with their family there is a dysfunction see as a family of God we have one father and we have billions of brothers and sisters no in-laws <laughs> We have one father and billions of brothers and sisters. The first thing that happens when you become a child of God is you enter the family of God. Second, you get to enjoy the fellowship with God. You can be as close to God as you are with your best buddy. In fact, you can be even closer. But you cannot have fellowship until you have a relationship. And you cannot have a relationship with God until you have a relationship with his son. Amen. I know many people will talk about a generic God. Oh, I pray to God all the time. Well, who is this God? Is it a, is it a figment of your imagination? Or are you breaking the first two commandments? Are you creating an idol made in your image? Because if you're not coming to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, you're not talking to God. Because you can only have fellowship with God through a relationship with His Son, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.9 God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, we cannot enjoy the family of God without enjoying fellowship with God. And that fellowship has a horizontal and a vertical direction. It's vertical is that we're in fellowship with the Father. And it's horizontal that we're in fellowship with one another. And if we don't enjoy spending time as a family, if we don't enjoy fellowship with one another, perhaps we should check our relationship with God. And if we have to check our relationship with God, perhaps, just saying, we should check our relationship with the Son, Jesus, as well. Because I know very well that there are some people who'd probably rather be on a golf course right now than listening to me preach. Perhaps don't like the singing, perhaps you don't like the, 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 the people who greeted you at the door, you don't get anything out of the sermon, you don't care for the people. Uh, it's all you can do to get through the service. It, it, it may not even bother you if you never came to church again. Uh, I heard a story about a little boy who missed Sunday school one week, and his teacher saw him the next day, and she said, Billy, you missed church yesterday, didn't you? He said, not one bit, ma'am. 
And unfortunately, for some people, that really is the problem. But the problem's not in the fellowship. The problem is the relationship. And you can have a relationship with Jesus, and that's the result of possessing Christ. Finally, we see the reason for proclaiming Jesus. John says, verse 4, We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. If you write down nothing else today, write down this. No one can have joy without Jesus. Without Christ Jesus in your life, you will never experience joy. You may experience short bursts of happiness. There may be times of circumstance in your life where you experience what we would call in America happiness. But friend, it ain't joy. Because if Jesus is not at the very center of it, it's not joy because he is the dispenser of joy. Jesus gives us joy. And, and there are four ways that we have joy. You can see them on the screen. And unfortunately, many Christians never get past the first joy, which is the joy of salvation. See, when David sinned, he didn't say to God, restore my salvation. Because you can't lose your salvation if you've really got it. You can't be plucked from Jesus' hands. What David said was, restore the joy of my salvation. Because see, sin is like a grimy buildup on your car battery. It hinders that connection. You get in your car and you try to start it up and it's bip, 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 bip. What's wrong? Well, you pay some guy an extreme amount of money to come out, pop your hood, pull the connectors off, the terminals, take a wire brush, scrape them, put it down, charge you 600 bucks, your car starts. That's what sin does in our lives. It hinders our relationship with God and it steals our joy. We have the joy of salvation. Unfortunately, many folks never get past that joy. They never experience the joy of Scripture. But Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Your words became to me a joy and a delight to my heart. Joy in God's Word. Letting God's Word speak to you, get into you, revealing the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the joy of opening your Bible and having an open heart and a listening ear and let God speak to you. Do it on a daily basis. It'll bring you joy. Third, we see the joy of service. Psalm 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. There is joy in serving the Lord. I don't like to call it working for the Lord. Some people say, well, I do plenty of work for the Lord. Don't work for the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve Him. Uh, there ought to be joy in your heart when you sit down with a group of students and open the Bible to them. There should be joy in your heart when, when you serve people food or, or you work at a, at a food pantry or a clothes closet and you help put shoes on the feet of a poor child that can't afford them. Somebody who's had their house burned down and, and lost every article of clothing they have. It's a joy to serve the Lord in doing things like that. It's not work. When we sing, when we, when we teach, when we serve on a ministry team, we have joy. But too many people, unfortunately, don't experience that. And then finally, there's the joy of sharing. Now, many people will look at evangelism and say, well, you know what? This is the pinnacle of being a Christian. I don't think it is. I, I think it's at the very base of being a Christian. It's what we're called to do. It's what we're supposed to do. It's what God expects us to do. Uh, he expects us to tell people about how wonderful he is. Because, you know, there's only one time in the Bible where joy in heaven is expressed. And that is the joy over one soul that comes to know the Lord. Because there's not only joy of sharing for us the blessing of evangelizing. There's joy in heaven when we do it as well. Two of the greatest joys in the Christian life is sharing the message of salvation and seeing the miracle of salvation. And John's saying, listen, my joy is incomplete. My joy is fractured if I'm not sharing Jesus. The great Charles Spurgeon once said, if I were utterly selfish, I would still witness for Jesus, for it brings joy to my heart. That is exactly the way I feel. I want to squeeze every drop of joy out of the fruit of my salvation that I can. I'm going to get everything out of the Christian life, and I'm going to put everything into the Christian life as long as there is breath in me. I want to have the internal joy, the external joy, and the eternal joy of leading people to Christ. Amen. There is joy in sharing Christ. Have you experienced the person of Jesus? Have you experienced the joy of possessing Jesus? 
Have you experienced the joy of sharing Jesus? You see, a Christian's life should be proof of their connection to the Father. Our sacrificial love for others is a testimony of our sacrificial love for God. Do you know God and do you love God? You can prove it by your obedience to Christ. Do you love your neighbors? You can prove it by being transformed by Christ. Just two months after retiring from Southern Evangelical Seminary, one of the greatest apologists uh, in, in, the Christ, in the Christian life, Norman Geisler, died on July 1st, 2019 at the age of 86. Uh, Geisler taught on the college or the graduate level for over 50 years. He authored or co-authored over 100 books. And he made one of the greatest statements about Jesus that I've ever heard. Quote, so I cast my lot with him, not the one who claimed wisdom Confucius, or the one who claimed enlightenment Buddha, or the one who claimed to be a prophet Mohammed, but with the one who claimed to be God in human flesh, the one who declared before Abraham was, I am, and proved it. The undeniable takes precedence over the unexplainable. Jesus is worth knowing, Jesus is worth serving, and Jesus is worth sharing. Let's pray together. Father God, we give you praise and thanks for who you are. We thank you for this beautiful letter. And God, as we stand just at the precipice of this, I pray that you will impress upon each and every one of our hearts exactly who you are. That you are God in flesh. That you are the God man. That we would affirm both the humanity and the deity of Christ. That we can have sweet fellowship with you. We can have sweet fellowship with the family of God through our salvation. That we can experience the joy of sharing Jesus with a dying world. And Lord, it doesn't take much. We don't have to look very far to see Satan's hand at work in this world and the lives of people making them miserable, making them addicted, making them scared, anxious, depressed. Whatever the malady may be, he's at the center of it. And God, we know that you are the one who brings us peace, joy, and hope. And so I pray, God, that you would use your word to transform our lives, that we would look to you and that we would find joy in your word and in serving and in sharing and in our salvation. Lord, I pray for those here today who have never experienced salvation, that you would reveal to them that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, that today, Lord, they would be convicted of their sins, that they would come to Jesus, lay those sins down at the cross, let you deal with it, and they would receive abundant and eternal life right here and right now. And it's in Christ's name I pray these things. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you want to enter into the joy of salvation, the Bible says that salvation is just a, a prayer away. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus is waiting and Jesus is ready. He has a free gift for you. He, he purchased it for you. He went, he went through hell so that you never would have to, so that you could experience the joy of eternal life with him. Our staff will be down front during this time of invitation. If you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior, we would love to celebrate with you. I talked about the joy in heaven, the celebration in heaven over one soul that is saved. Perhaps God's prompting you to be baptized today. Maybe he wants you to join our church family. Or maybe you just need somebody to pray with. Whatever your need, please come as the Spirit moves you.